Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on the spotlight on the, on the banking industry, the future of HR in the digital age. We have an esteemed set of panelists here today. I am super excited to not just introduce them, but to have the conversation with each and every one of them um, regarding this topic. It is going to be very exciting. I'm I, I, I cannot wait to join um, and for you to join this session and have the conversations with these, these excellent and, and experienced people on the panel. So to, without further ado, I'm not uh, going to stop the conversation. I am going to introduce the panelists or going to let you know who the panelists are, who then will introduce themselves. I see that one of our panelists who had difficulty to sign in has also joined us now. So welcome, sir. But I am going to ask uh, uh, Mrs. Tulu Deo Peters to start off this session by introducing herself to us. Tulu is, uh, Tolu, sorry about that, <laughs> is head of HR, uh, uh, head of Youth, Human Resources for SunTrust Bank um, Nigeria. Tolu, if you would like to introduce yourself to, to the participants right now and just give us an overview of who you are, where you work from and what makes your bank um, um, stand out from, from all the other banks in Nigeria. Thank you right. so much, Tolu. Thank you very much, Linda. My name is Tolu Lokwai Dio Peters and I currently work with SunTrust Bank Nigeria. Um, I joined the bank last year, uh, so I'm there barely a year. Um, I started my banking career about 21 years ago. Um, I've worked with some then Standard Trust Bank um, Limited, then I moved on to Bond Bank Limited. Bond Bank formed um, an alliance or an acquisition merger with five or four other banks to form the, the then Sky Bank, which has now translated to translated to Polaris Bank. So I was with um, Polaris Bank from inception for since 20, 2006 up to last year, August. Um, and while I was there, I did um, um, learning and development, um, strategic workforce planning, um, employee engagement, all the aspects of HR um, before, and then I became the head of HR for Polaris Bank before um, I eventually moved on to SunTrust Bank. So um, SunTrust Bank is a regional bank. Um, we have locations in six areas. We have in Iduna, Victoria Island, Ibumata in Lagos, Abuja, Portakot, and Uyo. And um, it's a fintech bank. So we're more on technology, yes. Yeah. So we don't, that's why we don't have as many branches as you would see with other banks. So that's one of our selling points. Um, so from the comfort of your home, you can transact your businesses and you can do your, you know, your transactions online, um, digital platform. So that's basically what I do and where I work. Wow, so truly the future of banking lies within in, in yes. uh, the stuff that you, I suppose, also moving in the time that you moved from a bank that even I know <laughs> as a foreigner, the Purple Bank, you know, um, even even I know know that bank to to a bank that I I must admit, but now I I understand why that move in a time that you moved. I get it. I get it. So looking forward to your to to your experience and and to your. Um, knowledge when it comes to 21 years that is just phenomenal wow thank you so much thank then you, thank you thank you so much then mr adeleke adeleke pitan who is the former head of human resources for coronation life and assurance if you would like to coronation life assurance if you would like to introduce yourself to the panel thank you so much all right um, good afternoon everyone um my name is Adelaide, as um, Linda said. Um, I think my experience is slightly different from the Tolu's experience. Um, I've been in banking, asset management, insurance, private equity, and um, pension fund administration. Um, so I've kind of gone around in finance. Started out my career in banking, um, worked for um, a top three bank in Nigeria, moved on to a much smaller bank, then moved on to the largest asset management firm in Nigeria. Well, of course, you know. I had to, I mean, I had exposure to, to asset management, securities trading, pension fund administration, private equity, before moving on to insurance. And now I've left insurance again. Um, 
I think uh, Womick makes my experience quite unique in some ways that um, I'm one of the few people in HR you know, that have done both HR and finance. So I can speak to both the people side and the money side, if you will. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. It is a different uh, different uh, experience, a different set of experiences and a different leg of banking that you can add value to this conversation as well. Um, I'd like, if I could ask you, there's, there's like a little bit of a reverb when you talk. So I don't understand because we, we tested, you know, this is technology. Eh? We tested it before we started, but there's like a, it's like you're talking into a funnel. So I don't, I, I you know, when we, if you could just, um, just be aware of that. Uh, I don't know if it's a connection, but just be aware of that so that you so but I will stop you when you when you when you when we don't hear you clear enough. I will okay. definitely let you know, let you know about that. But thank you so much and thank you again for being part of this public holiday panel. <laughs> then William, Mr. Awana, the a founder and CEO of Hajem Consults. If you would like to introduce yourself, please, sir. Thank you, I will. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, well, thank you for joining us. My name is William Awana. Um, uh, similar to Tulu and, and Adelika, I've had some experience in banking. As a matter of fact, I think I've done about 20 years or I've done about 20 years, um, you know, over the last several decades. You know, I went from uh, banking operations, I did corporate finance, I did some bit of HR. Uh, but I really found my niche in finance with a focus on performance management. So that is really what I bring to the table in terms of uh, the banking experience. I ended my banking career as the corporate, the chief financial officer rather, of the corporate and investment banking directorate for Sterling Bank. You know, so um, off of that, I just jumped straight to what I'm doing now, which is consulting. So Hadam Consult really is uh, my baby, my brainchild. I've had the idea for quite a while. And what we do essentially is to focus on leadership and business development or business coaching rather. So we focus on uh, providing training to individuals and businesses, right? Focusing around six core areas, leadership, finance, entrepreneurship, communications, management, and strategy. So what we do is to provide the knowledge based on foundational principles that you can use as an individual and as a business to scale. Um, I think I think that's about it, long and short. Wow, that's a, that's, a, that's a mouthful to start off with. I think leadership and coaching is so essential in today's life, maybe even more because we're so remote and we, we underline the remote business. So I think what you are doing is actually very noble, um, taking your experience and sharing that to the level of actually training and developing people to know what you know and to add value to an organization. So, so that's uh, very noble. And, uh, I, uh, and doing it within, within the entrepreneurial environment, again, I have such respect for, for what you do and, and, and the effort that you, that you have to put in to get all of that done. Looking forward to your experience and your 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 views on on the topics that we wish to reach today. Then I see two more speakers that have joined us. Thank you so much, William. I I can't wait to learn from you. Um, two more speakers, um, Alex as well as Izuna. So Alex um, comes to us for, as the head of human resources at Nine PSB. Alex very interested in 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 what you have to say but if you'd like to introduce yourself and say something about your company um i know that my south african colleagues are very interested in what you <laughs> what you and your company do so please the floor is the floor is yours if i may may say so but introduce introduce we're looking forward yes alex all right thank you can you hear me clearly we can hear and see you very clearly Fantastic. Um, these days, since everything has gone virtual, we are mostly at the mercy of our internet service providers. <laughs> um, so my name is Alex Ohai, I'm head HR at Nine Payment Service Bank. Um, so just a brief introduction about the bank. We are new. We are new in the banking space. Um, so in 2020, the, NAM, the CBN licensed a few organizations to start what has been called payment service banks, basically with the mission to drive financial inclusion in the country. Um, understanding that the 
if you are going to help people break socioeconomic barriers, to be able to grow, break poverty and move up in their and do better for themselves financially, it's important that they have access to financial services. Now, the regular banks cannot reach a lot of these people where they are in the interior villages and all. And so it would be difficult for you to expect that the regular banks that we have right now are able to, to set up branches in those areas. And so based on that thinking, the CBN came up with an initiative, right, to say, what can we do to address this problem? And so the payment service banks were, were born, running basically on digital technology. So um, when Ms. Dio Peters was talking, she said they're a digital bank, they have a few branches. We have zero branches. We don't have any branches. We run basically on technology. Um, so what we do though is that we are strong on marketing. Um, so strong on marketing, strong on technology. So people, wherever they are, can use various channels to um, open bank accounts. We run an agency banking network. So basically the guys you see on the street, the POS, uh, agents on the street where you can withdraw money or deposit money are basically like our branches and it is through them that we are able to provide banking services to people in the region in the villages in the interior parts of the country where normally you wouldn't find regular banking services um, and i think that listening to everyone talk so far i feel like i'm the baby when it comes to banking experience i don't have 20 years banking experience, but then I do have over 10 years of experience in people management and people development across the telco and um, banking where I am right now. So I have worked in learning and development, I've worked in recruitment, I've worked in HR strategy, and that has all been put to play right now where I'm working as a startup and you have to set up the entire HR department from scratch. So all of that has played into where I am right now. And that's me. Alex, that is very, very exciting. And you're touching on, on something that I think that uh, our South African audience members is not understanding your PR, POS agents and things like that. I try to explain to them what it's all about okay. um, <laughs> and how it works. Because we, 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 you know, POS for us is when you pay for something at a, at a retail store. Uh -huh, exactly. The concept yes, of POS here, uh, here in Nigeria, I think it is phenomenal and something that needs to go global and not just be stuck here in this area because there's there's so much that we can learn from you there so i'm really really hoping that we will find the time so that you can explain to the audience as well how that works within the Nigerian environment and then of course working for a startup within something that i think it is the future of, of the banking industry is how do we sit because how comfortable is it to just sit and, at home and do your banking from here um mm -hmm. so it's really it's phenomenal i'm very very much looking forward to sharing for you with you sharing sharing information about that and then oh, another panel yeah. member thank you so much alex mr Uz oh, you must see uh, me and nigerian names i'm not always very successful with it izuna the CEO of Ritz Investments Advisors Limited. Izuna, if you would like to introduce yourself, am I number one? Please excuse if I'm saying your name incorrectly. If you would like to correct me, please do so. I see that you are online. I don't see your camera or see see your camera being put being there. If you would like to you unmute Izuna. Maybe it's a connectivity oh, yeah. connection issue. Okay, I think he's going uh, going to sign out and sign in again. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for those introductions. They were very brief, and I I I, I applaud you for that because it's very difficult for I know anyone when they start talking about the organisation to stop. <laughs> but it is lovely to to hear that, and 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 again, I'm saying please be conscious of our South African audience as well who needs to learn from you because what I see in like the Nigerian back there we go, Ms. Um, Mr. Izuna, I can see you now. Yes, am I audible now? You audible and visible. Fantastic. Okay. If you would like to introduce yourself, please go ahead and do so. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Izuna Onjobi. Okay. Um, I don't have a very large, elaborate CV or presentation to present myself. Uh, <laughs> I would just say I attended the Institute of Management and Technology 
uh, also attended uh, Enugu State University of Science and Technology, uh, both are acquired mechanical engineer. So I am the engineering person in the financial industry. So I later decided to um, get some certification while working um, in a, a IPI industries here in Lagos. And working there, I decided that um, and I would like to be more of an administrative person. And I decided I went ahead to get some certification in PMI. And I now switched to WAPIC Insurance, where I gathered some experience as an underwriter, then switched uh, from there to uh, a bank assurer at Access Bank in Nigeria. And from there, I decided to form a formidable, a formidable team together. We now went out, uh, we decided to start up a fintech industry. That was how REIT uh, Invest came about. And um, we've been there now for about uh, almost four years. And uh, we are pushing towards to making it a, 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 a full-blown uh, financial technology industry. So um, starting up uh, REIT Investment Advisors has been hectic and we've gone through the HR industries. You know, as a CEO, you have to be everything all in one because you don't actually have the whole funds to, to pay up everyone for consultation and uh, professionalism. So we just need to grab all the necessary experience, do more of reading, do more of researches, uh, get new and better uh, mentors that will be coaching you here and there, you know, and um, so far we've been successful in our dealings and here we are today uh, talking about it. Yeah. Uh, and, and talking about how we are moving forward and moving, moving towards an even more technically advanced banking industry. So I, like I said before, I, I am super excited about, about you, you sharing your, your, your knowledge with, with the audience today um, regarding the banking industry in Nigeria. I think um, there's just so much that, that we, we need to learn from one another and, and maybe on, on those touch points, start our conversation. And, and anyone can take up this question and start our conversation with exactly what most of you have have uh, uh, pinpointed as one of the, the ways in which we move forward. And it is this, what is your view on the digital and new age technologies and their overall impact on your business and the impact on the banking and finance sector? I think let's start off there, um, although it's a little bit down, and then we can, I think with that question, we will address how the impact of, of, of COVID put us where we are today. So maybe shall I just call on someone or is there someone specific who would like to, to, to answer the question specifically or make the question into your own? I would like to start the conversation with that one, that digital age, new technologies and the overall impact that it had on business. Mr. Adeleke, would you like to, to, to start us off with this conversation? Oh, is there someone specific who would like to start us off? I didn't want to put you on the spot there, sir. No, no, sorry, I missed the question. So the question is, in your view, what is well, what is your view on the digital and new age technologies and their overall impact on businesses today, specifically, okay. obviously, with the banking and, and finance sector? Okay. Um, so in terms of the new technologies, um, I feel, sorry, is my, is my audio um, okay? Yeah. So, yeah, so what I foresee is going to happen, and that's already happening, is that um, a lot of professionals in the finance field will have to pick up a bit of a few IT skills, right? Um, so, if you, so if you look at what's been happening in technology, first of all, you have your blockchain movement, which means that, um, I mean, the way I see it, a lot, of the, a lot of your led, you probably need less people to work in your ledgers. Um, you might need to have finance professionals who also understand the you know, blockchain ledgers and can work with those accordingly. And that makes transactions and the whole accounting process um, different and probably more effective. Um, and, and technology is also eating away into a lot of the things that have been done manually just a few years ago. Um, so correspondingly, you've also have seen a rise in um, no code platforms where in the past you have had to wait for some guy in IT to write you know a program for you to do XYZ. Increasingly I've seen a lot of um, employers asking that well, not in Nigeria the works I think that's what's going to happen in Nigeria in a couple of years asking that 
um, people who are applying for certain roles should have familiarity with no code platforms like an IFTTT, uh, Microsoft, um, Power Apps, and the likes. So that's something that you increasingly see a lot of. Um, I also think generally the skill set is changing. So that when I started banking, really every banker was a salesperson. So even if you worked in finance or worked in HR, the expectation was at some point in your career, you're going to grow, you're going to have to hit the streets and you know bring in millions of naira. But that's also changing as well. Um, the criteria for success a decade ago was a very large branch network and a very large sales workforce. And that didn't happen with the case. If you look at the new banks springing up in Nigeria, they're mostly small. Sometimes they have no branches, but they've been very, very effective through digital marketing and social media. And I think that's going to increasingly be the case for banking. Um, even when you look at the financials of the banks, at least for the publicly quoted ones, I dare say the return on equity for the larger, for the smaller banks seems to be better than the larger banks. Larger banks have bigger books, but in terms of um, how much, are you, how much um, are you making your ROE? The smaller banks seem to have it better, and that's only going to keep being the trend, you know, as the years progress. Because even in terms of the demographic of the country, I think about 60 or 70 percent of the country is less than 25. So increasingly, young consumers who do not want, who have been conditioned, you know, from when they were very little to to get things immediately. Um, so just, you know, um, I'm just, I'm just a funny story. So when I was young. You usually have to stand in front of the TV, wait for the color bars to clean out before you can watch cartoons. Um, these days, even my son picks up his tab and he wants to watch something right now. He's not patient enough to see if he's going to get interesting, or like was the case when I was young, on this age. Once the first five minutes are boring, they're switching to the next program. So that's pretty much the mindset of the average upcoming consumer right now. They want things immediately. Um, so it's up to banks to find ways to optimize their services. Because now uh, nobody cares if you have a wide, wide, wide um, branch network. They want to put it on their phones, they want to put it on the go. You know, so that's a very different type of consumer. The world itself is changing. Technologies that didn't exist maybe 10 years ago exist today, and they are more widespread. So you probably don't have to invest as much in your IT infrastructure that you have done years ago. You know, probably buying the very, very large servers. I know we used to have a UBA back then, but you can pretty much just plug in online, then subscribe to a virtual server somewhere in. Germany or Eastern Europe and you know you go. So that's what I see as the trend right now. Thank you so much for that. I want to you touched on on many on many points that I think we can we can we can have webinars on um, separately. You know, the skills need that the new environment is requiring from us, blockchain. You know, and how we 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 use that local local platforms, and how the need for for grabbing the attention of 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 the younger younger users or users that are becoming our new employees. You know, the millennials, but becoming our new employees and and wanting this information, and if it doesn't grab them when 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 uh, within how many seconds they move on to the next, because that is the people and the and 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 the. The, the advantage of, I think, information and the challenge for all of us. I was wondering um, if, uh, if, if you, Alex, would like to add to that, because there were things that, that Mr. Adeleke said here that also had, um, had a lot to say about you, what you said, that, uh, both, um, both you, Alex, and, 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 and Tulo, saying that there's the branchless or going to less branch, branches and, and having that uh, that that thing that there's not, you know, when my, my my boss told me when I'm going to come to Nigeria, he said, "You will see, on the street corner will either be a bank or a church, right? Because <laughs> that's that's what you will see in Nigeria." And what you are talking about is exactly the opposite. Where where yes, you see that now, but it's changing. So I don't know, Alex, if you would like to add to that, uh, maybe Tulo, if you uh, sorry, Tolu, if you would like to add to that as well, because both of you touched on that in your introduction as well. Okay, I don't know if um, Ms. Diopisos will want to go because I was in and out, so I didn't really okay. get what um, okay. Mr. Okay. Perrett said. Okay, all right. So, yeah, so just taking from where um, Adelike said, um, the digital space is changing. And um, for me, it's change management. You have to grow with the change. So um, digital um, in the, news, uh, the new age in technology is about change management. So organizations have to be nimble, 
They have to be agile and they have to be responsive. Because as I said, um, the consumers are not gonna be waiting for us. So we need to be fast and we need to invest in technology. And um, the way the brands work now, they are connecting more with the customers. So you find some brands um, doing um, fairs, um, the fashion fair, the food um, shows and all of that. That is a way, that is in a new way to connect with it and engage with the customers. Because you find that the majority of the cons consumers fall into the millennial space, as Adelike mentioned. So you have to find a balance into how you can connect more with these people. Again, we start seeing um, squeezed margins, inflation is high, um, increasingly high operational expenditure, and of course, profit is low. So how do you want to go about this? So your brick and mortar will not work for you again because I mean, diesel is at a very high rate right now. I mean, we are talking about almost a thousand naira for a liter of diesel. So how can you connect with your customers? How can you um, um, provide the kind of services that will engage your customers? It's using the digital space, it's using technology and leveraging on this. I'm sure Alex will pick up from this and- um, Yeah. Yes, I, I, this, yeah, Alex, Alex can definitely talk about the POS here as well. So, but what I, what I like about what you're saying is that, that exactly your services um, is not going to be visited anymore in the brick and mortar, but you are responsible now to bring your services into the palm of your customer's hand. Exactly. So, so that, that I think is, is, is super exciting when it comes to the banking industry um, and, and how easy it is here in Nigeria as well. I mean, I've experienced it as a foreigner, um, um, you know, the comfort thereof. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen in, in South Africa, but the options are just more. So maybe, Alex, if you, if, if you would like to come in here, because it's exactly, and, and the other thing that, that, that I would like to touch on maybe a little bit later is also something that Ms. Adeleke said, as well as you said, um, Mem Tolu, is, is exactly that. Change management is becoming key. Agility is becoming key. And Ms. Adeleke said it's, it's, it's sometimes the smaller banks that are much easier to change or move towards that change simply because the bigger banks has, has a much bigger ship that has to take 70 kilometers in order for it to turn, where in the smaller bank, a little aura can just make you turn. So how do we, how do we adjust to that? And how do we, we do strategize towards that? Is strategy still there? We saw with, with, with COVID, your five-year strategy became a two-week strategy that you had to implement, right? So what is the purpose then of, of still having these five-year strategies if the agility requires that you adjust them in a, in a moment of time? Alex, would you like to add to that? Um, I think they've both um, touched on the, the biggest points here, um, but just to mention that something that COVID, um, the pandemic brought to the fore, was the fact that um, you need, like you've said, digital transformation within organizations, and how can you quickly leverage on that to bring about a change to your people? We had the advantage at 9PSB that we didn't start out as a regular brick and mortar bank, right? Um, that notwithstanding, though, even at the beginning, with the strategy that was put in place when the organization was being formed, there was still sort of a a leaning towards the older way of doing things. Maybe we had to put branches in different states, but as we learned, and that's the thing that the pandemic does for you, you, you learn and then you have to move quickly. And then we had the advantage of being a small business. We realized that that definitely wasn't going to work for us. What is the important thing for us here is we need our customers to be able to reach us. We need them to be able to carry out the services that are important to them when they need it, how, they, how, it, how it is convenient for them. And because of that, we, we quickly realized that we were beginning to, if we're not careful, we're going to begin to lean on the things that were going to take us into some of the space that the legacy banks are now having to deal with, where you have older banks that have one vertical that is traditional banking and then another vertical that is digital banking within the same space. And then you find that there is a, diff there's a challenge in getting both branches of the bank to work together. So we now said we quickly had to dump that and then come to the place where we realized that, okay, it's agency banking. That is the only option for us. One. Secondly, technology is the deal breaker here. How are you going to leverage your technology to ensure that you are able to deliver what you have promised to your customers? And so that's generally what you are going to see 
because of the pandemic and how it has opened our eyes to realizing that work happens, that digital is the, is the deal breaker. And once you can leverage that, then even the margins that um, Mr. Peters has talked about, you are able to, you know, expand it a bit more because you're no longer, the OPEX is less, okay? Because you're no longer running branches and spending diesel and all those heavy costs. You can do more things with less people and less overhead costs. Yeah, yeah, with less strain on your, but I, again, I, I think what you are saying here is also a question that we need to pose and, and, and a question that, and Mr. William, I'm going to throw this one your way as an entrepreneur founder and a very, very gutsy human being to start a business in, in an environment that is so saturated or believed to be saturated. You can answer that one too. But what I like, and, and, and the question that came to mind, Alex, when, when you spoke, is that how do we then overcome this gap between tradition and demand? Because tradition required it in some way. You know, this is how we do banking. And they are very experienced people stuck there you know, which links us to, to what um, Tolu said and what Mr. Aleke said and so forth. Stuck in this is how we've done the way. And the demand that's out there, the customer need that's out there, and the people who have to serve that, who habitual, do what they know, because we all like that, right? We're creatures of habit, ne? Do what they know. How do you train your customer to move beyond? I mean, think about how you had to train your parents to do internet banking because they, they're scared they're going to break stuff by pressing buttons. You know, those type of uh, uh, skills that needs to be, even in your customers, that need to be transferred. Mr. William, I know I've kept you silent for a while now. If Not you would like to, to give us your, your, your insight into this as an entrepreneur, founder, CEO, um, and, and your experience coaching and leading these people, because I'm sure that there's some of the things that we said here that, that you hear often. Sure, sure. Thank you. And I think that's a very important question. Um, I think even, even before I try to leverage some of the things I'm doing now, I'd also like to go a bit backwards and, and draw from my experience as a banker, right? Um, so we've touched on a couple of important things, such as what has been happening in the banking industry as a whole, right? And pre-crisis, we saw things like, um, you know, revenue pressures, we talked about that, um, and we're seeing the, the digital disruption, right? Now, in addition to that, we're also seeing things like credit losses that are impacting the bottom lines of banks, right? So all of these things are happening, and, and it's showing us that these things are going to continue to happen because as digital disruption accelerates, uh, the traditional banks, right, or those that are focusing on the traditional banking models are going to find it harder and harder to keep their launches. So what do we do? I think that the answer predominantly lies with HR, and I'll tell you why I say so. So um, I ask myself, what is the most important thing that HR brings to the table? Right now, you could look at it a number of ways. You could say it's a sense of purpose. You could say that um, you you want to make the culture great for the for the staff working there. But I think above and beyond that, we also need to look at the externals, right? And what I mean is that I think HR has a very big part to play in giving the the people that are working in the organization um, an organization that is wired to win in the workplace or in the marketplace rather and and what do i mean i mean that everybody's looking for results right the bottom line of what we're doing whether we're in we're in hr we're in banking we're in finance whatever it is okay. is that we want results right that is what our customers want that is what our stakeholders want that's what our shareholders want so how do you guarantee results and i think the way to do that is to look at it in two um separate angles there's the people aspect, right? And then there's the digital aspect. And I'll quickly explain what I mean by that. Now, in my experience, and I'm, I'm talking now about what I'm doing now, um, the company is hinged on two sort of pivots, right? The people, right? Which is your most, in, your most important asset. And then your system, because people can be champions, but it is only systems that win championships. So you need to be able to marry the two. Now, on the people side, what HR, um, I think, needs to be focusing on is how do we provide that leadership? I heard a very interesting definition of leadership, which I, I quickly want to share. The person said that leadership is the capacity to influence others through inspiration, 
generated by um, a vision propelled by a conviction which is based on a sense of purpose so if you give someone a sense of purpose you 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 give them the vision this is what we're going to and you build the passion in them they're more likely to be influenced by what you say but on the other hand you also need the digital aspect in other words we're looking at, are we do we have the right people right that are aligned to what we're doing um can we use analytics right to assess the people that were that, that are on board the people that we want to bring into the fold and as such make the organization a stronger place that is on the one side on the other side i think it's also important for us to be um to be a lot more customer responsive i heard this really important story or interesting story rather about the head of compensation that was working with um this motorcycle company i'm trying to remember the name now harley davidson oh, right yeah. so they noticed that yeah they noticed that after a while revenues were dropping especially during covid and the 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 chro said look why don't you go out there go to the next rally we're having and hear what is happening hear directly from the people so the person goes out there she rides a bike she joins the rally and then the the customers are coming to meet her without realizing that she's the head of compensation and we're saying and they're saying look uh we know that this is going bad um the the oil thing on my bike is not so she's 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 taking those notes right and she's noting everything and she's going back to the company and saying look um this is what the people are saying um Lake, i think it was adele k and one other person made that important point about what the customers want now they're looking for um an experience and lots of these people the younger generation are saying that i went to this place and i had a bad experience right um they want they want you to earn their loyalty they're not just going to come to you because you're existing they want to see what is in it for for me right and they are very they're very um technologically savvy uh, I think it was Lake who talked about his son, you know, going straight to the iPad and, and all of that. I have that same experience with my daughter. She's three years old. She goes to YouTube and she says, "This is what I want to see." So these are the these are your new bosses. These are the people you have to deal with now. And for you to for you to be able to get to that space where you're satisfying these people, right? It means that you have to invest pretty heavily. I think, in my in my opinion, in in IT, right, and ensure that your people. Um, are also invested or they're also investing in that sort of space because gone are the days where you can just stay in your in your little corner and say okay i'm the finance guy and this is what i do no 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 it's not going to work you need to be able to understand how your job now is able to be propelled by it how can you do your job better how can you do it faster how can you disrupt right because that is the name of the game you're you're in a you're in a position now where everything has become increasingly competitive and if you're not able to um, maintain the pace that is going on now, you're going to find yourself out of pocket very, very quickly. So long and short, invest in your people, invest in your digital space, know what is happening with the customer and marry all this together to become a stronger organization. That's my, that's my two cents. That's a, that's a beautiful, and, and I would like to add also something that you said is exactly what you said there, but then uh, uh, cement that your people and your digital in your culture, your purpose, and the value that you add to their lives as an organization, because then you're going to, if, if you don't do that, you're going to lose your people to the competitors, because this is a very competitive, competitive environment, especially if they have that skill that Absolutely. everyone is looking for. And everyone is talking about skills in, in, on this panel. Everyone is referring to, to customers. The only person that hasn't done that yet, and it's because I haven't given him a chance to talk, is, 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 is Zuna, if you would like to add to that, sir. Okay, um, I totally agree with what William just said. Um, he said more, we have to focus more on the HR. And you know, the HR departments that they have um, so much on the tip, they are like, how will I put it? Um, they are the chief talent officers. So they know what exactly happens inside and within the firm. And you know, another, see, another uh, space that I'm looking towards is to look outside. And that is what I perceive as the future of HR. In, in today's generation or in future generation, yes. Uh, the future of Asia, that's when they look outside, outside the confinement of their space. So what they are doing inside the, the organization, I think they have to try to take it 
also outside the, the organization. Outside, when I, when I say outside, I mean the customers, the investors, the, 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 the communities, the, the state governments, what you have to take it, you have to go, go out from, in as much as they are doing what is going on on the inside, they have to still take it go now on the outside. And when you go outside, do your feasibility studies, when, what you see is that mostly everybody now is going digital, everybody is going technological. And how do you reach the wider audience? How do you bring them back to be? How do you bring them back into your system to be part of the company? Now, making as you're building the interior organization, you're also building the outside organization. Now, what do they want? How do you attend to them? How do you reach your wider audience? You see now it's technological wise. William said you just can't overemphasize on IT. Now that IT you have to start building. Because currently, right now in rates investment, we are building, we are working on a full-blown industrial technology space where we can reach more and more and outer audiences in, in, in every part of the world. The world I'm talking about, I don't even, I'm not even bringing it down to, to, to this country, Nigeria. We want to know if we can join the likes of other, um, uh, like 9PSB, nine, nine uh, uh, what they call them, piggy banks and the likes. Do what they do, try to reach out to the other organization. And how do we achieve this? I think the HR from the inside, they have to work beyond that. Go to the, their strategies, how they deal with their present customers, how they deal with their, uh, their staffs, the training, their staffings, their, their, their career development, and all that. So when they, you get the HR right, I believe they will know when and where to go out, seek for the, the best talent that will come and give you what the exact thing that you want in your firm to go to the next and higher level. So um, I will yield for now to so someone complete very short. I think what I what I mostly uh, uh, took and would like to pose back to the panelists about what you were saying is the absolute strategic importance of HR within any organization. Gone are the days that HR are only the people who hire and fire and wish you a happy birthday on your, on your birthday. There is no way that HR can be like you are saying, because you're not just taking care of your internal stakeholders. You are aware and taking care and seeking the external stakeholders as well. And that which you have part, which you are part of as, as an HR professional or someone who comes from the HR, um, um, you came to the ranks of HR to be where you are today, is because you understand that completely, that you cannot leave HR out of your strategic discussions anymore because they are the managers of the people who are your greatest asset um, and your biggest, uh, out, uh, you know, let, let's be honest, I mean, HR is, is also the biggest cost, you know, the, the salaries are always, it's expensive to employ people, you know, but Therefore, the responsibility on profitability, the responsibility on, on all of that, even bigger. And, and I struggle with the idea that there are still organizations who keep HR out of strategic discussions. So, so maybe we should, should, should continue the, the, the conversation um, exactly there, is that, that long-term strategy that is required to, to embrace everything that everyone has said in their introductory Oh my goodness! In the introductory uh, uh, statements and and response to what we are talking about, what is the strategy going forward? Uh, taking everything into account, is there anyone who would like to to take that one on um, at um, first? Yes, let me, let me say Alex. something. Yes. Yeah, let me say here. Um, there are still organizations, like you've said, unfortunately, who keep HR out of strategic conversations. Um, so what happens is that um, the executives at the executive level or C-level, however it's structured within the organization, basically just take high level decisions. And the department itself, the HR department is basically just there to administer whatever decisions have been made at that level. Unfortunately, what this does is that you have not allowed your HR bring the, 
um, the experience and the knowledge that they can bring to the table where, because it is their forte, because it is HR's forte, they have taken the time to understand what is happening in the environment, in the, in the space in which you're operating. And they are able to now bring that knowledge to bear on the organization because they are closer to the people than senior management, executive management is. Um, that being said, we are in an industry, or we are in a time rather, where there is so much focus on personalization. Um, the, the tools that we work with, the platforms that we operate on, everybody is trying to further and further just personalize whatever information that they can give to you. So they are forever mining data. And uh, because of that, the people that you we work with now, and we may say millennials, but I think everybody, everybody these days, when you go online, you expect, even though we say we don't want anybody gathering my information, we do expect to a certain extent that the information I get is tailored to me. I don't want to go online and Google, I don't know, some random, maybe, uh, I don't know if it's just me. I lost Alex. He's frozen. So okay. Trying to get back, maybe I can just add a few things to what she said. Yes, please. So for me, in terms of long-term strategy, is um, creating a different employee uh, value proposition. We have a new set of people outside. So what do people want? What kind of skills are you looking at to get? So um, we're looking at getting results rather than FaceTime, not the people physically present at work, but what output they're able to generate and what results we're able to get at the end of the day. So in doing that, again, um, technology is rapidly advancing. So looking at the kind of skills that will help the organization become uh, have competitive advantage over others. Right. So what you need to do is also check um, the skill sets that is required. Do we want to build or do we want to buy? You know, so building means that it may take a long time. You would have to have your strategies in place. You're building pipelines. You're bringing, um, building successors and all of that to so fill in the place um, at a later time. However, you may decide that you want to also buy the skills and these competencies in the immediate because technology is fast at, uh, um, advancing. Um, it's rapidly changing. You may not have the time to build. So you want to buy. So what skills are required at this time? So for that, you need to also check the critical roles that you have in the organization. You have to keep um, upskilling people, constantly um, bringing new uh, ideas, um, initiatives on board, um, using your technology, your e-learning platforms, your virtual meetings, your virtual um, apps, you know, all of these things come into place to ensure that your people are well-skilled, to ensure that you deliver to the customers and to, the, and to provide the right services. I'm so happy that you brought up skilling because many or, or very often than none, people think, oh, the technology, technology, I'm going to lose my job. But we, we need to also make sure that those who are already here with the wealth of experience that they have within them, and you will know, but the wealth of experience that they have, how do we upskill them? How do we make sure, you know, take that fear away of the technology mon monster and machines are going to take over the world, you know, um, funny. But but it's also, it's, it's, it's exactly that. It's, it's, and, and that's a strategic human resource management yeah. decision. Do yeah. we upskill? Like you're saying, do we buy or do we do we invest? basically, is what you were saying, in who we have. What is our succession plan? How do we move forward from here? And then how do we leverage the people that we already have? Do we use them to their optimal potential? Mm -hmm. um, and William, you can, you can add to that as, as a coach. You can maybe say that too. Because very often than none, there are these gems that we are not aware of in our teams already that we are not optimizing their potential um, because we are so engaged in, in, in just the bottom line that we forget about people development, that we forget about how, how much we can harness of the diversity within our group. So, so I don't know, William, if you would like to share your, your, um, your, your thoughts on that. I just want to welcome Alex back. Alex, I'm so sorry if we you you went a bit wonky. So we continue the conversation. So uh, once William responds, if you would like to conclude your argument, I would I would gracefully hand over to you there too. Mr. Right. William, if you would like to respond to that. 
Thank you, thank you. I think that is an absolutely important question. Um, and I, I would answer that by looking at a bit at my personal experience, right? Now, when I entered banking, I did not have um, a numerate degree. I didn't read banking, I didn't read finance, accounting, none of that. I happen, my first degree happens to be in English language, right? So I got into banking operations and I was doing your normal, uh, you know, cookie cutter stuff, you know, receiving checks and paying out cash and all of that. But it's somebody from HR, you know, to have that personal interaction with me and say, look, dude, I think that you, um, you can be more than this. N not not saying, not, not um, wanting to um, say that banking operations is, you know, down there, but looking at what I see you do, I think you have the potential to be more. And because of that discussion, I was able to move away from banking operations and get into things like corporate finance, right? Get into things like core finance, get into things like performance management, such that 13 or 14 years down the line, I found myself as the CFO of the most important division in the bank. Now, I wouldn't have had that trajectory if not for that conversation, most likely, right? So I think it's, it's important to, um, like, I, like I said at the beginning, you know, not just focus on analytics or data, but also look at the people because they are your most important asset. You said so yourself. Um, and you have gems. That, that's a beautiful word to use, gems, really. Um, I, I, I wrote my first book when I was still working in the bank. It's called Entrepreneur First Class, and it's, it's really targeted at people who want to start a business. And when I wrote that book, I, I presented it to my, um, my superiors, you know, my executive director, my MD, and they were like, dude, where did this come from? We didn't know you had this. They wouldn't have known, obviously, if I, if I didn't, first of all, bring it out. But um, um, if I wasn't also encouraged to do so, because I was working in an in a culture, in an environment that said, look, you know, you don't, you don't just have to do what is put in front of you. What are the other things that you think you can bring to the table? It doesn't have to be limited to your JD. You know, what are the things that you're passionate about? And based on that, you know, I, I wrote that book and I presented it and, um, you know, it, it, did, it did a couple of good things. So I'm saying in a, in a sense, in essence, rather, that um, the people who are working in the organization are much more than the faces that you're seeing when you go to work each day. You know, um, I believe that everybody has a gift that they can use, that they can bring to the fore. Um, and yes, it will take time, but if you deliberately invest in the people, take time to know each person, take time to understand what drives them, take time to understand their motivations, I think that you would have a much stronger workforce at the end of the day. And remember that I said initially that, you know, People can be champions, but it is systems that win championships. You have to find a way to build the organizational capacities, right? And it comes from um, harnessing the individual potential and making it stronger. It's better to have um, it's better to have people who, quote unquote, might be average, but who are determined to pursue the target that you set for them, rather than a few individual stars in a pool of, you know whole people right that way everybody's moving towards the same goal with the same direction with the same vision and you're able to achieve those results um i'd also like to add i think i've said so before so at the risk of sounding like a broken record um it is also important to move away from the internal focus right Be which is which is kind of like what we tend to do maybe it's because that is what we've known right but um, moving into the customer space, moving into the investor space, because like I said, everybody wants results. And the way things are going now, everybody in the organization, every department has to be seen to contribute effectively to those results. So as HR, we're saying, okay, fine. Um, yes, we're building out the people internally, but what are the things that we can do externally? right uh, by way of meeting with the customers it doesn't have to be every customer the key ones the key investors okay what what do you think that we're doing that we could do better what are the things that you'd like to see from us as an organization those are the things that you hear that you bring back to the table you talk to the md you talk to the um, um the key players and decision makers that you can use to build up the organization and you know um get get something going you know thank you and talk to your customer they will give you they will give you the feedback that you need and we're scared to do that we're scared to 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 hear what our customers have to say but sometimes it's it's wonderful to hear what they have to say 
um, um, because they have positive feedback. You know, I, I've been on a website of, 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 of it was, a, it was a, uh, a delivery company the other day where you can track and you can basically digitally track your package and everything and everything. And I wanted to compliment them on the service I received because it was a, a miraculous delivery. I really thought it took, it, it took so such a short time to get to me, but I couldn't find a space on their website to give them a compliment. I could find a space on their website to complain or to hear where my pay and things like that but not to complement their services and i found that very interesting and luckily i know the head of of, of that company uh, in west africa the person responsible for it and i contacted him i said do i want i want to give your company a compliment where do i do that on your website <laughs> So yeah, I think I started open a little bit of a can of worms for them there, but that's that's what I'm saying. So your customers can be your biggest source of of change, agility, what you need, um, as long as you respond to them, and as long as you respond to them uh, um, with grace and and with customer service excellence in mind. And that is also something that we can talk a whole day about. What does that look like, um, Alex? If you would like to finish what you said, or or, or shall Miss Arileke, if I saw you also unmuted yourself, which is normally an indication is, oh, I want to say something. So, yeah. so <laughs> Alex, and then Mr. Arileke, if you would like to add to that. Um, okay, so I I kind of have a sense that um, the point I was driving at has been made, but just to say that um, it's important that while we are in the space of or we are in an era a time where we are all driving down and just looking for gathering more and more granular information we cannot forget that in the end it's people that we work with it's people that come to the office every day it's people with backgrounds and families and pains and challenges it's a whole person and if an organization is going to be able to stand out in the digital era i think that even beyond hr and this is something that i'm pushing at 9 PSP, it has to be the kind of leadership that we see across the organization it has to be human centered you cannot as a leader just focus on the metrics on how people are able to generate results and use that as the sole um, foundation upon which you are making decisions about your people. As we find in this in this generation, and I think we tend to focus on millennials, but I think it's something that it's a it's a culture that we will find that is that cuts across every age these days. That people want to be committed to a cause. People want to know that they are part of a bigger story. They want to know that we are driving for this particular outcome and they want to put in themselves into achieving that outcome. But for you to be able to align your people behind the digital strategy that you have to create this big change in the world, you have to first of all buy the hearts of the people. And you cannot buy the hearts of the people if you're going to be looking at them as ones and zeros that some fancy application is generating for you. And so human-centered leadership to me, I believe is going to be a defining factor for organizations as you go forward. People want to work in places and organizations where they know that as a person, if I come first. If I have an issue with my family, if I have an issue um, in my family, I can come and talk to my manager. I can talk to my leader and it is heard. Even though the business is all about performance, and that is not to be taken lightly, but is there a way that you can take performance in one hand and take your people as people in the other hand, and then find a way to ensure that neither of these things suffer? It takes a little more work. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to just to, to, um, to lean on to one side or the other. Um, it takes a little more work, but then it can be done. And that is something that we are building towards, looking for ways that you as a leader realize that your people there's so much more to them. They want to grow. The example that uh, Mr. Awana gave, where he said, somebody came to him and said, okay, you are doing this thing right now and you're doing well. Would you like to explore something more? It takes a leader who sees that, that possibility. It takes a leader who is open to um, just come to the office and do your work and then go home to say, okay, maybe I should extend open up, give you more, uh, more opportunities, and then we can see how far it has brought him. No matter where he goes, he will always have that experience to refer back to. And those are the kind of advocates that we want to see within our organizations. And that's the point I was trying to make then. Mm. 
That's very, very valuable. What you're talking about, the conscious leadership. And Mr. Uh, um, um, Awana also said that culture, purpose, value. We're, mm. we're, you create the culture, culture that enhances the purpose of the organization that adds value to not just the employee but the employer as well but that yes. doesn't just ask leadership it asks of the followers to buy in true you know and and the employee to understand that there's an opportunity behind learning and it's not just financial you know, mm. because because many very often the now and this is our all all performance uh, um, systems and how it works. People were only rewarded with with financial uh, financial uh, rewards, not other th- you know opportunities or mm-hmm. or, or uh, um, you know uh, um, days or, or something like that. It was only based on more. Carrots. You know, and and money and money and some people yes, money drives us all. It's it's nice to to have money to buy bread. But some people are driven by that purpose, by that higher uh, um, value that they see within the environment that they are and, 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 yep. and value that they find within the organization and how they link to it. Uh, mm-hmm. It's true to, you know, emotional, spiritual intelligence, conscious leadership, um, environmental mastery. That's, oh, I'm going academic, but I shouldn't do that. <laughs> but that's exactly it, is seeing the opportunity and doing something about it. Uh, um, uh, 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 William will, will be able to say that he saw an opportunity and he ran with it as an entrepreneur. Many people have wonderful ideas, but they stay stuck in being an employee because of the comfort and security of that salary and the bonus and things like that. How do we inspire people to think like an entrepreneur? within our yeah, organization, within organization, you know, because those are the people that makes the difference, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the yeah. people that advances your organization. Um, Adeleke, you had your mic on as well, um, or you have it on still, if you would like to add to that. I'm sorry okay. if I took the words out of your mouth. Thank you very much, Alec. That is absolutely something that we could leverage on. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so what I was going to say is that, um, I mean, I hear the points of the other panelists, you know, I mean, loud and clear. Um, but I think a lot of legacy banks are going to struggle immensely for one major reason, um, culture. Uh, so let me let me compare this to like a football. When you buy a football straight from the store and you're kicking it, you know, it's very easy to kick, right? But the more you kick it in the mud and the mud kicks on it, the harder it becomes to kick and it probably just doesn't move at the point. Um, what am I saying? This a lot of the legacy banks are, I mean, they're like after football, right? They've had decades of being kicked in mud and they become, I mean, they, they become a lot hardened in their own ways, right? Um, because it was very important to have hierarchy to manage large groups of thousands of people in you know across the country and probably across borders, they just had the hierarchy. And then here's how the bureaucracy and all that. Those things don't work well in this new age of financial services we're talking about. Um, also because of that hierarchy and because you need to have their bureaucracy and ways of doing things. What you will find in a lot of them are people are very streamlined to what they do. This is how we do it here. Um, and this is where you report to, don't change it. But the culture we're talking about now is the one that requires employees to be, um, to be very creative have the if have have the space to express their creativity freely without fear of consequences and to continuously nurture their curiosity. Um, I'm not sure if the same I, for across all the banks in Nigeria, but I'm willing to bet that that's probably the case. You're not going to get a lot of not going to get ahead you know, just you know um, being curious and creative like they're going to get sanctioned because nobody wants things to go wrong. We've put these processes in place for. X, Y, Z reason, right? And um, it kind of reminds me of what Peter Drucker said about how culture is strategy for breakfast. Mm-hmm. So you say you want this strategy, Australia is to become a digital digital bank. Uh, we're going to appeal to millennials, yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. We're going to put up a, some nice pictures on social media to show that we are cool and we are fun. But at the very heart of the organization, at the very end of the organization, you are, you are a stodgy old timer. You've been doing things like this for so long and quite, fr- and in a lot of cases, 
maybe the people that even run the banks have been doing that for like 20, 30 years. They're not going to change because some new kids just come out and say they like, you know, X, Y, Z. So I think that's probably the major problem a lot of companies are going to face. How do they solve it? Um, I think my own thoughts would be radical on how to fix that. Sometimes it's probably best to just start, just start afresh. So there's this ad company in Nigeria, I've for, forgotten the name, I think it's Prima Garnet. And at some point, they, to, they, to, they, they thought they had gotten a bit still. So it's up a rival um, ad company to compete to them, you know, for this for the same clients. Um, there's a bank manager that did the same thing some years back. I'm not sure yeah, how well that went. And when my bank started up a rival digital bank a lot. So it's the same with my bank, but this one has supposed to have a different DNA, have new people and hopefully, you know, attain more traction. I feel that's the way a lot of banks will have to go. They are going to make any headway at all because um, the way a lot of them operate uh, has been so baked into their DNA that it's going to take a very long time for them to get successful at this and being digital, if I thought they get successful at it. It's coming back to what we we said in the very start of this of this webinar is that how the, uh, agile are we? Uh, I think it was you who said that, Tulupe. How agile are we? How how do we manage change? How innovative are we to stick to our internal and external customers? Personalization is very important because it's what we all want uh, to feel that we are uh, that we are. Um, valued um, as a customer also as an employee that's that's we social beings that's that's as old as stone age right um but i think what you are saying is very important is how do we as the as the larger corporations of, of banks how do we embrace what the, the 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 psbs are doing and could do within a span of two three seven i don't know five years um alex that you you guys have have, have been in the business and and taken on and being the disruptors that people are that people are getting uncomfortable about you know because you're talking the language that 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 or you're answering a need that is out there and that needs to be that needs to be addressed you know um mr uzo uh, um ay izo nia izuna if you would like to add something to that, please just turn in and, and, and give us your thoughts because your your company, if I understand that as well, um, is also quite large and influential. How do you deal with that? How do you manage change, manage agility, ensure that your employees uh, uh, feel feel valued and, and your culture is that which embraces new ideas? Um, if you would like to say something about that. Okay. Um... Thank you very much. Uh, I would say, first of all, um, we, we focus on creating values. Uh, we focus on creating values in more of our activities, okay? And we try to understand the context of our work settings as regard our, the staff, the in-house, the people that we have in within us. In as much as we are doing that, we make sure that we try to stay connected to our stakeholders both the ones that are inside the company and those that are outside. And we, uh, we channel all these things to the HR department, try to make sure, put them on checks and balances to make sure that they are the one carrying out all these activities. You know, we'll make them to make sure that they, they bring insight of knowledge of action to, to also talent acquisition. What do we need? What do we want? What exactly do we, and we, we, they have the free and, I'm talking about the HR guys, they have the free and the free old to question leadership uh, when uh, if there's anything that they believe that um, they can do to also check the, the leadership because the HR, they are also part of the people that control as in make sure the leadership doesn't, you know, make the because of their power or the office that they hold they try to do as no make sure that everyone is the same because uh, the in as much as we value our customers our staffs also are, are valued because they are competitive advantage the the these people so when i mean the people i'm talking about the staffs the and, and our customers so we make sure that we balance all those parts, all those environments that uh, are going on, that they don't 
and they have the right capabilities and culture that requires the way that we move forward in our in, in our activities in the company, you know, and mm -hmm. as much as we, the leadership wants to make sure that they have the right uh, departmental structure, as in they have their, their department is straightforward, they ask the HRs to make sure that they build their departments and let us know how their structure and how they're going to organize, how their organization is going, is, uh, is, is work turning out to be. Because I, I believe that the HR, they are more like uh, the, 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 how will I put it? We place them more highly, more of the CEOs in their environs. They are like the, um, the how will I put it this time? The one holding the, <laughs> they are the one holding the firm, like the pillars holding the firm, give them so many, so many responsibilities uh, to make sure that they carry it. And we believe that if they carry all those things, if they carry out all those activities, and uh, that will get more and greater results, okay? More and greater results. And um, what I wanted to say mainly is, um, because I, I, I shared about this topic of the story, you said the future of HR. So uh, I've always spoken on this issue with Regenesis. So because of the, spe the, the species and what I've learned, you know, I try to unlearn and relearn also, you know, take it to writing, put to book, go back to the drawing table, call our HR and make sure that this and this and this is what we've learned and this and this and this is what we put to practice. Go out there, meet the people, what do they want, get the correction, bring it to the table, let's fix this and let's get it right this time. So we are just beginning in this part and I believe uh, we are heading forward. And I, I want to implore that when most, uh, things like this go on, we are here to learn also, you know, and contribute to our own resources because that is what I am. So with all these little um, uh, strategies that I've put in place, I believe uh, 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 things going on, things will go on the way it should be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also what is very, very important to also understand whether it's a small or a large, large organization, innovation and create creativity must also be planned. It must be structured. And it sounds as though it's polarization, right? Because creativity is all over the place and we be creative, you hone the, but even within, or specifically within the work environment, a, a creative uh, uh, ideas and innovative plans need to be planned because it has to be implemented. Otherwise it is just pie in the sky. You know, so so we can't just go into an organization or, or expect an organization to 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 uh, have these wonderful ideas. S someone can have those wonderful ideas, but there's always an operational person that has to get to the nitty gritty of implementing that and implementing these wonderful ideas takes a plan. You know, and, and that's that's why I'm saying that innovation and creativity goes goes hand in hand. Yes, but in an organizational environment, if, if for it to be successful and for it to be implemented, it's got to be planned. You know, um, other, again, there's innovation management and innovation planning and there's strategies behind that. And and, and that's, a, again, another in the conversation that we have. But this uh, 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 tick. Uh, fintech and, and uh, digital enhancements that we've experienced in the past three weeks. None, none of us are the same that we were three years ago. Not the same employee, not the same family member, not the same person, because we were forced to, to grow, whether we were comfortable with it or not, right? And how do we now take that and make sure that it is something that ensures growth? Within within the organisations that we are part of, um, it is it is I can't believe quarter past one. We've got fifteen minutes left. I think we need to organise a, a banking sector um, spotlight on the banking sector two point because we haven't even started talking about what um, what the future of HR means. But I, we've touched on a lot of things. So if I might ask each and every one of you to provide us with your final thoughts, provide us with uh, what you would like the audience to leave with um, from everything and everything that we just, and we really just touched on, on, on issues here. I would love to continue the conversation at a, at a later stage. But Mr. Um, 
Izuna, I'm going to start with you this time because I always left you for the last. <laughs> if you would like to give us your final thoughts and summarize your, your ideas or, or what you want the participants to take from this conversation. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, I, I'm here to learn. Uh, we can't do without learning. There is nothing that is like education and this uh, host is educative. This, uh, when I go to uh, uh, places to speak, what I tend to do there, in as much as sit, uh, I sit with other speakers, I also sit with the eyes of the audiences because I am, I'm there to learn. And most of the times, I, in as much as uh, sometimes I don't take notes, I just open my brain to make sure that those notes are in there, okay? So I would say um, in the balance industry, what I would do right, is that I would try to upbuild my HR department to be more um, uh, open to questions and more open to the, to the public, to the space, to make sure that they acquire and they get what they want. I'll have to align, I'll make them to align, integrate and innovate uh, the, their HR practices, okay? Make sure that the, the culture of what is going on, I, I, I had what someone said here. He said, um, uh, is it Peter Drucker that said, uh, culture eats uh, strategy as breakfast. I, I think I tried to comprehend that and I, I, to my own understanding, I learned a little bit. So we need to go out there, get the, the culture, know what they are doing as much as you are planning, strategizing, because you might finish strategizing and at the end of the day, you won't even get the desired result that you want because of the culture of the environment. So you need to go out there. And today's world is digital. And what, whatever we are planning or whatever you're planning, you have to go out there to the market, to the environment, to the community, and make sure that uh, you get feedbacks from those people, OK? And also invest on HR people. I think I do that also. I do that also. I invest on our HR guys and make sure that um, uh, they are well taken care of because when you take care of the HR guys, they will take care of your staffs and your firm. Probably they don't speak able. You won't, you'll be as, you'll be amazed what you channel as a as a senior executive. You channel your energy on more productive issues, and um, mm. I'll make sure that um, our analytics also comes for measurements so that measure everything and. Uh, in a space like this, in a, in a congregation like this, I implore us to learn. Uh, no one is above learning. Education is the key. Uh, when we learn more and grab as much as we have, um, take it and put it to work because action, action is everything. Thank you very much. Action is. Thank you so much. So that is that is that is wonderful. It's about learning and allowing ourselves to learn. That that I love that that statement that you made. Thank you so much, Adelike. If you would like to summarize or, or tell tell the audience what you think they need to take from from this experience. Um, <clears throat> I think we, I think we all live in interesting times now. Uh, the things we hold to be true are not true anymore. So we have to figure out a new path. The rule book has not quite been written yet. So, I mean, the opportunity is there to write, write from the scratch. Um, something that we need to prioritize as organizations, even beyond financial services, is uh, we need to, um, first of all, start recognizing that there's a new generation coming to the workplace with very different perceptions of what work is and how that forms sort of identity. So um, I guess my father's time, they used to be um, civil servants or the IBM man or the, uh, I don't know, or the XYZ bank man or whatever. They, their identity was shaped by this is the world. Right now, people's identities are shaped by their perception of things around them and they are very multivariate. Um, yes, they like technology. They are also passionate about certain social causes. And um, how organizations can take advantage of this to let people bring their authentic selves to work, not just become automatons, right? Um, yeah, pretty much. Um, I also think that, I mean, in doing that, um, to the, I'm sure a lot of my HR people probably watch their pills at this point. We have to do it with the rule books at this, you know. Um, 
there was a time when we wrote certain something called the um, staff handbook because we have African province making mess of themselves at work. But this day we need to ask ourselves to what what purpose does this really serve in a world where I don't have to adhere to a fixed work schedule. As long as I get the results done, you really care if I'm if I if I log in because we didn't come to work these days. If I log in at um, 8 a.m. and log out at 5 p.m., do um, you really care that I've that I've counted all of the um, um, widgets? I, I, I count 20 widgets a day, or I'm just working for results. So that affects things like how we give out sites to the work, affects compensation because we certainly are in that compensation now should be more about um, creativity than, you know, in creativity and learning. So you want to type a competition practice, creativity and learning, as opposed to, I don't know, just saving 10 hours, making money. Um, even, even the way we design our learning and development right now, um, I think currently what we try to do is very, very strict, very scripted by the L&D department. They tell you, these are the things we think you need to learn, go and learn them. But right now, there are so many things out there, the world is changing so quickly, that maybe we should be the ones who are to learn. We can advise them that maybe this would be nice for you to learn, but let people find their own paths um, and take on those things they feel they need to, they, they feel might be, might be necessary to create a job. Now, even if you, the other person doesn't see it. Adeleke, we, we're losing you a little bit. If you want to bring uh, the mic closer to you. Oh, okay. So I was saying that go. a lot of HR practices have to change. Obviously, compensation and benefits have to change. Um, it's not enough to be working for tenure and I don't know, hitting their performance targets. You just want to be able to tie in your competition practices to learn to how, how I many people are to learn, are they learning new skills? Um, from the L&D perspective, it's not enough for you to prescribe to people what to learn. Um, I think you, should, you can advise them, like you think it might be a good idea, you know, for you to learn, but because quite often the individual sees far ahead and the organization sees, it's possible that individual employees are seen that certain skills would be very, very important a couple of years from now. So you want to get another flexibility to pick their own learning and chart their own cost. Mm-hmm. And um, performance management, so, so many HR practices that we need to go and write from the scratch. For large organizations, uh, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a pessimist that they will be able to change fa- quickly enough you know, to take advantage of the changing landscape. Now, like someone once said, they said the larger banks are like, um, you know, the small banks, like the PSB, they're like the Ferraris. When you get to turn, you just turn the car and it just goes smoothly. But for the much larger banks that have been here for decades and probably hundreds of years, they're like your 16 wheeler trucks. When you get to the bend, you have to slow down <laughs> and then turn it very, very carefully and delicately because if you don't do that and try to be like a Ferrari, your, your truck just, you know, roll over and uh, make a mess. Yeah. Um, I think it's, I, I think, um, the, the coming years are going to be very, there's a lot of ambiguity in what those years will look like. Um, maybe a bit of chaos, but you know, every chaos is an opportunity to do something even better. Yes, opportunity to grow. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, if you would like to give your closing remarks, we can see you. So we need yes, to have <laughs> Hopefully the network holds out until I'm done. Um, okay, so yeah, so a lot of what um, Mr. Adiliki said, I I do agree with it. Um, it's important that when we think about HR, actually, when you think about any um, industry vertical now, you cannot think about it as a be your end all in itself. It's important that all these days we find out that you have to leverage so much more methodology from other verticals in how you deploy your work so when you talk about agility and a lot of the some of the methodologies from it and how they come into play in hr requires you to then realize that you have to change the way maybe not change but constantly evolve in how you deploy your work as a hr personnel within the organization, how you're deploying the HR strategy. So the first thing I would say that is takeaway for the audience and even from what I've heard from all the other panel members is that HR has to continually be agile. We have to continually be learning and not just from within our own space in HR, but look at how things are done in other spaces, in IT, in marketing and branding. And how can I leverage that if I want to build the right employer brand for my organization? All of that knowledge must 
come to play if you're going to be a rounded HR professional in this in this um, in this era. That said, it's also important that we 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 are operating in very regulated environment. Banking is highly regulated. CBN is on our backs, asking for reports every other day on how you're employing people, how people are leaving the organization, and you have different organizations that you must send reports into for regulatory compliance. That being said, though, um, talked about how the people these days are changing, how the generation is changing, how people that are coming to work are changing. And while we must be compliant on a regulatory standpoint, we still have to find the space in between, within ourselves, where we can allow for innovation and creativity. Um, because when you have very structured environments, very um, regulated and regimented environments, it by default tends to stifle creativity and innovation. But as banks, if you are going to be able to leverage on the new thinking that we see now, we have to find a way to create a space within the organization that allows people to be innovative, be creative, try out new things, all while without falling foul of the regulatory environment and what is expected of us. So that's another thing that I think is important for us to take away from here and how we think about balancing those two things, the creativity and the regulation that, um, that drives what we're doing. Um, I think the third point I was going to make, if I haven't forgotten it now, is around culture. Right, we've all spoken about culture. And like Ms. Adilike said, we don't know. So um, the, the older banks, yes, they are like the 16-wheeler. You try to turn too fast and they, are, they flip over on their side or they've broken the head is in one direction, the back the bed at the back is in a different direction. Um, but what they are, we are seeing that they're doing now is that they are creating smaller organizations, even within the bigger ones. So I think with GT Bank, we have Squad now. Then in Wema Bank, we have Alert. And then we have the smaller organizations that are, quicker to respond to the um, to the operating environment. And it's the same thing that we want to, yes, well, the bigger, it may take a while um, for the bigger organizations to change. Um, it doesn't mean that we should then throw up our hands and say, okay, then there's something that can be done. Because no matter what, you still have people working in those organizations and the people that still expect a lot from management in response to where the market is going. So we have to keep our hands on the pulse see what we can do to keep shaping one little change at a time, but ensuring that we still get our organizations to the place where people are happy because the culture, while it delivers on what the business needs, also delivers on what the people expect. Yes, absolutely. Bridging that gap, gap we were talking about. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, thank you. William, if you would like to give us your final thoughts. <laughs> okay, thank you. and. Um... Thank you, Linda. I, first of all, I, I'd like to preface my comments by thanking um, all my co-panelists. I think we've done, or you have done an exceptional job um, speaking to the issue at hand. Um, I'll keep mine very brief because I think that most of what I perhaps would have wanted to allude to has already been said. So I'll just quickly say two things. Um, the first is, is a quote actually by George Bernard Shaw. It's a popular quote. I think most of us might recognize it. And he said, um, so men see things as they are and say why but i dream things that never were and say why not uh, the future is is unwritten right and even though we've gone through covid nobody knows whether that that is the last of it you know are there going to be more iterations are there going to be some things that would happen further down the line that would disrupt us so i think we need to be continuously prepared for such eventualities as they arise. And the best way to do that is to um, adopt a mindset that is willing to embrace whatever comes, right? Because if you look at the history of mankind, we have always thrived where we have been in crisis, right? Every innovation that has ever changed the world actually came about in a time of crisis. Um, and if you're able to adopt that mindset that says, no matter what comes my way, I am going to continuously improve myself. I'm going to uh, prioritize learning, right? Because everybody wants to be successful. Everybody wants to be successful. Every business wants to be successful. But the way we tend to pursue success is, is that we run after it. But that's the wrong way to go. If you want to be successful, don't pursue success. Instead, pursue becoming a person or a business of value. Why? Because it is value that attracts 
success. So work on yourself, work on your potential, work on the things that will drive you to be a better person, which in turn would leverage the organization to be a better organization. And then you have, you know, that 360 going around and everybody is happy at the end of the day. Um, I don't think I want to add in much more. That's I'm beautiful. You. You've added such value with many of the statements that you said. I mean, Regenesis, let me just, I, I'm also allowed to punt, right? Our, uh, um, our, our, our brand or what we stand for, our, our slogan, our motivation is to awaken potential. That's what we strive for. And, and we strive to, to do that with each and every person that walks through our door because every person has the potential to, to grow exponentially. And that's what we believe in and go, go for. So Miss Tolu, you have the beauty to close this whole session and the burden to close this whole session for us, if you please. All right, thank um, you. I think, um, um, all right, my other panelists have mentioned quite a number of things I wanted to speak to. However, it's necessary that we have the right values and make sure that there's an alignment of purpose between the individual value as an, uh, as a, as an employee, as HR, and the organizational value. We're all looking to ensure that we have results. So there has to be open-mindedness, um, continuously developing the employees, the people connecting with them, connecting to their hearts, um, not limiting themselves. And in closing, there's something I'm going to say. There has never been a better time to be a great HR leader, and there's never been a worse time to be an average one. The average one will do the job the way it has always been done. The great ones are going to step forward and say, how can HR be a, a strategic asset to the company? Um, we have to stay relevant and add value to, uh, to the organization as a whole. Thank you. That's beautiful. I am so so grateful for all of your your value adds <laughs> all of everything that you said here there's like i said there's so many things that i would like to if, if this was a a master class with students in front of us that i would have liked to prompt you to teach the entry to teach the students about hr to teach students about how business in the real life especially your business that is so heavily regulated how it is in the real world, what is happening in the real world out there and what is expected from employees in the real world out there. So I am forever grateful for your time on this public holiday. I'm just saying that again, um, on your, uh, for your time to share your knowledge, to share experience, to share your thoughts um, as leaders in the inter industry. So thank you from Regenesis side. Thank you, thank you so much for adding value to the, the, the participants. There weren't even questions. I, I even forgot to check that. So my apologies to the participants for not looking to see if there were any questions uh, um, because there was such beauty in what each and every one of you said and value that you added. So I am so grateful for your time, so grateful for your willingness. And like I said, this was live streamed and recorded. So at any time, if you need a link to it, please let us know and we will do so do so. From my side, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so, so much for being part of this webinar, for sharing your experience, for sharing your knowledge and being so open with, uh, with, with what you know and, and uh, what you've experienced. I'm forever grateful. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a glorious rest of the day. You can now go and put on your pajamas and watch Netflix for the rest of the day. <laughs> Only the Nigerian people. The South African people must continue working. <laughs> Recording Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.